One must die. Someone close, yet you will be a willing sacrifice. There is no one that I'm close to. Not necessarily someone close to you. There are others within the scope of my vision. I've seen a lot, but I've grown weary. That is all I can see for now. I need to know more. There won't be any more. The rest you must figure out for yourself. Go to the castle, seek out your vampires, build up your reserves, prepare for hell. I will keep that safe until you need it. The oracle goes silent, settles down and closes her eyes, apparently falling asleep. She even starts to snore. Alec watches for a moment, then gets up with a sigh and leaves the room. Exterior, Woods Day, 20 years earlier. Young Alec glances behind him, runs into something. He bounces back and falls to the ground. He looks up to see Brian, standing above him, about 35 years old. Brian reaches down and grabs young Alec, yanking him to his feet. Young Alec starts to head off, but Brian holds him in place. Be still, son. Brian reaches into his clothes, and a moment later, the creature jumps out of the fog. Its front paw stretched out, and its fangs bared, going for the kill. Return to present. Exterior, bridge, dead. Alec is standing on the bridge, looking out at the castle in the distance. He stands there for a few moments without warning. He turns and stalks off towards the castle. Exterior, blacksmith's shop, dead. Abe is working alone. Peter, holding himself a very prissy light, strolls right up and taps Abe's back with his walking stick. Abe, in surprise, drops to his work, almost burning and cutting himself. Peter waits impatiently. Abe settles his equipment down and turns to Peter annoyed. Peter looks up at the sky, overcast, and on the verge of rain. Fine morning, blacksmith. You know, one of the seven guardian creatures of the wood was found lying in its own blood this morning. Dead. Did you know anything about that? A guardian creature killed? Impossible. Well, I would have said impossible had I not seen it with my own eyes. Tell me, old man, you wouldn't happen to know who could kill such a creature. There was a stranger came into town this morning or last night. You know him? I saw him briefly when we spoke. And what did you speak about? Not that it's any of your business, but he asked after my services. He's apparently just passing through and asked how quickly I could repair his sword. And what did you tell him? I told him I hadn't worked on a sword in years, that it might take me a while, some, quite some time to do the work. He's to decide if it's too long or to turn it. <coughs> I wonder, a creature dead, Three centuries as well. Three centuries as well. Nine centuries? Three of the master's dark children and the creature, all in one night. And then this stranger, only passing through. Coincidence? Oh, maybe. But our master doesn't think so. I'm to look into it while they sleep, as though I had anything better to do with my time. <laughs> Why come to me about this? I'll question the stranger in due time. I have to scrutinize everything. Including Trisha. Yes, well, how is her memory ventilated, old man? Any creep up that's not supposed to be there? It's the same as always, as you know. They know she'd never fight them. She knows the consequences better than anyone else. Even better than either of us do. She, or she would have remembered anything. Yes, I know that. Do you know that? The elders probably know as well, but they'd rather make sure she didn't revert to her childhood ways, that she remembers what the master thinks necessary, and nothing more. If anything changes with her, I'll be the first. She'll tell. You know that. You always know that. Hmm. What about other things? She's never going to agree to be with you, Peter. You must realize that by now. Tell me, old man, what was she last night? She was with me. <coughs> we had dinner at home and turned in early. Yes, she said as much. It's the truth. Remind her 
that she is being watched carefully. <coughs> you all are. Also, tell her that she should be more accommodating to me. I'd be able to smooth things over a bit with the master if she just changed her mind. Do you seriously think that you have that much of a say with them? Just don't forget, old man. Peter turns and storms off, a watching. Exterior castle day. The castle appears deserted and ne neglected. The front is open. Several windows are boarded up. Alec approaches and enters the castle. Exterior castle courtyard. A simple courtyard, it's run down, though once beautiful. Sitting on a stone bench, with a blank look on his face, is Brian, about 55, frail. He hasn't bathed in weeks. Alec enters, doesn't immediately see Brian. He starts off when Brian makes a cooling noise. Alec's hand goes to his sword, but stops when he sees Brian. Alec goes over and sits beside Brian, looking at him. Do I know him? Alec. Have you found my boy yet? His name's Alec. We lost him not long ago. We're desperate to find him. We're trying, sir. We may be close to finding him. Brian stares at Alec for a moment, as if he were lucid, but then, just as suddenly, he's blank again. His gaze shifts away from Alec to nothing. Without a word, Alec turns and goes further into the castle. Interior castle hallway. Alec walks along the long hallway. He passes a side corridor, about to walk past it, but stops, tilting his head, listening. Interior, council chamber. The six elders are all looking in the same direction, focused. They're all whispering, chanting, but it's soft. The master emerges from the darkness, a hood hiding its face, and joins the elders. Interior, castle, hallway. The whispering could be heard from here. Alec stands there for a moment, as if debating, then confidently steps into the side corridor. Interior, council chamber. The elders look concerned as the master flinches slightly, then quickly glides back into the darkness. A moment later, Alec enters the chamber, stopping immediately in the doorway, facing the elders. Alec eyes the six elders for a moment, while they remain still and silent. Where is your master? I have no qualms with you six. Your elders, aren't you? Parasites, a lot of you, for all I care. There's a master down here in the darkness. I can feel it. Well, I have no intention of searching this castle. It'd be pointless. You six are here, so there must be a master. Elders are spineless without a master nearby. What's your business here? That's better. My business should be obvious. What your master is going to do about it is another matter. Our master would deal with things in due time. In the master's time, not yours, half-breed. You can sense that much, can you? Only that much. We're not mind readers after all. I suspected as much. Your master and I are at odds, and won't end pretty now that I'm here. That's all I need to say about it, and your master will know how to find me if it wants to go quietly. We doubt it. Alex stares at them for a moment, grunts, and then storms out of the chamber. All is quiet for a moment. Then the master slithers back in. He is a strong one. Did you hear? Yes, I heard everything. And if he thinks I'll go quiet, he has a lot to know. He knew where to find us. Vampires hiding in a castle doesn't take a genius to figure. <laughs> Besides, he's a hunter, that's for certain. And he's strong. That doesn't matter. I'll make that change. Alec is walking toward a bridge. Dense forest is on either side. A figure hidden in the nearby trees follows along, keeping in the shadows. The foliage rustles, but Alec doesn't respond to it. Alec reaches the end of the forest and stops, just before where the bridge starts. The figure stops as well, still hidden. You might as well show yourself. 
I know you're there. I've known for some time. If you show yourself, I won't kill you. The figure steps out of the forest. It's Trisha, <clears throat> holding a bow and arrow. Alec briefly glances down at the bow and arrow, then up at Trisha. That's the first weapon I've seen since arriving here. You working for them? Of course not. Why'd you think that? You claim to be against me being here, then you follow me armed. I thought the vampires would have destroyed weapons like that. You know more than I thought you'd know. They did destroy everything. I keep this hidden in the woods in a hollowed out log where they can't find it. I still think it's too dangerous for you to be here. That it caused more trouble than to solve, but that doesn't mean I'm one of them. I'm not for provoking them like you're about to do, but I think I should be prepared for whatever happens. Do you know how to use that? A little. Enough for it to matter in a pinch at close range. Have you practiced? I would, but there's too much risk of being caught even during the day. But how hard can it be? Harder than you think. Coming? Trisha hesitates a moment as Alec continues. She then follows him. Exterior bridge continues. Alec and Trisha stop about halfway across, looking towards the distant castle and forest. As they talk, it continues to get dark now. It's not safe to be wandering around after dark. They don't like it. Unless for a specific reason. What happened here? Why don't you people fight back? We did have warriors, long ago. What happened to them? Most were slaughtered in the early days, slowly and painfully. The rest were turned as punishment, doomed to serve the master for all time. Their homes were burned and their families were killed, as an example to the rest of us. None survived as human. None of us that remained were trained in battle. If we were to try to fight them and fail, we would all suffer. We're all fearful. We're farmers and craftsmen, every single one of us. We live our lives and pay our blood tribute and never raise a hand or voice against them. It's safer this way. Alec remains silent. In the distance, several people are making their way towards the castle. What, you don't agree? I've seen this all before in many other places. It's always the same. To tell you the truth, I'd rather die and have those I love die than live as you people have chosen to live, as slaves. Being free is better than being safe. Oh, you sound like my father. Oh, I've seen a lot of my travels. I've seen good men do horrible things in the name of trying to be free. I've seen honest men lie and cheat, and great men reduced to animals. These things, these vampires, they leave us little leeway in regards to what's right and what's wrong, what's moral and what's not. Alec watches the sight of the castle of Jerusalem, noticing the swaying of the trees, the sounds of the forest, the calmness of it all. Your father is a smart man who wants to separate himself and your people from these parasites, these monsters. You're smart still to call me to fight them himself than the fight of himself, since he draws no attention to himself, nor to you. But why are you here? What do you mean? Here, at this moment, with me. If what I represent is so distasteful, why are you talking to me now? Well, if you're about to destroy everything, I wanted to see the man, or whatever the hell you are, and look him in the eye. Now that you've looked, what have you seen? Why are they going to the castle? Buildings are deserted of everything except vampires. They're going to the chapel to hear the master speak and pay whatever tribute they have to offer. It's required. I should be there as well. If everyone goes. If able-bodied, yes. Then I'll be there as well. He walks off the bridge towards the castle. A moment later, Trisha follows. Interior chapel night. The chapel is small and packed with people. At the front of the chapel, in a large alcove, is a stone altar. There are three large stained glass windows around the altar with images of demons, devils, and other such creatures. Peter is beside the altar, at attention. His eyes are unfocused. He's zoned out, not seeing anything. Alec and Trisha enter. Trisha does not have her bow and arrow with her. She goes over and sits next to Abe. Alec remains at the rear of the chapel. Everyone avoids him as much as possible. He keeps his attention on the altar. Fall starts to slowly make its way into the chapel from the three stained glass windows, coming in through the cracks. The fog thickens, and the alcohol begins filling up with fog, but it doesn't go beyond the confines of the alcohol. 
some tendrils of fog move out of the main body and come down the aisles and among the people like hands, reaching out and caressing. Another tendril of fog reaches up and caresses the back of Peter's neck. It actually reaches into the back of his head, taking control of him. Peter bangs his walking stick on the stone floor three times loud, the sound echoing around the chapel. Everyone grows deathly silent. Everyone stares forward, all dazed and unfocused. Alec is the only one unaffected. He keeps his hand on his sword, ready. The fog begins to dissipate very quickly. Seven figures are now standing behind the altar, the six elders and the master. Alec takes a firmer grip of his sword. He moves forward toward the vampires. He keeps his head lowered as he walks, but then he raises his head and in the process, meets the master's eyes across the chapel. Alec stops suddenly. He's being drawn forward, though he's fighting it. He stops again. The master takes a step forward. Their eyes still lock. Alec seems suddenly ill, his complexion suddenly pale. Exterior, woods, day. 20 years earlier. Young Alec and Brian are standing in the fog and haste woods. The creature is bent down, gnawing on a hunk of rotting meat content. That'll keep it busy for a while. How do you know to bring that? I have my suspicions. Now. Brian suddenly turns. A figure emerges from the fog. It's the master. The master raises a hand, palm up, moving fingers. A ball of fog gathers in the cupped hand swirling and turning, constantly shifting, pulsing with life. Young Alex stares at it, mesmerized. Brian steps forward. Before he can do anything, the master quickly pushes the hand forward, forcing the ball of fog forward. The ball of fog flies through the air and hits young Alex smack in the face, throwing him back as the fog engulfs his entire head. Return to present. Interior, chapel, night. No time has passed. Alec takes a few startled steps back. He's suddenly afraid and very sick. He quickly looks around, but no one has moved. The master is leaning against the altar, holding its head up with a hand, trying to watch everything at once, but also disoriented. Alec quickly stumbles out of the chapel. Alec stumbles out, dazed, confused. He leaves the castle still in the same way. Interior chapel. The master hasn't moved, is watching the door. Several vampires enter from the rear of the chapel. The master turns to look at them. Go feed. Remember, two different ones from the last time and don't kill or change. The vampires nod. All are intimidated by the master. The master motions them forward. The vampires greedily enter the human ranks and choose their meals and start feeding. Trisha is one of those they feed on. None of the humans react. Exterior woods say. Alec stumbles along. He stops and leans on a nearby tree. A low growling comes from behind him. Alec turns to see a guardian creature crouching low, snarling. Alec stands unsteady, his head, hand going to his sword. To the side, a second guardian creature emerges, then a third from the other side. Alec is surrounded by three guardian creatures. He draws his sword. One of the creatures suddenly pounces. Alec turns, but is too slow. The creature dives to the side, and Alec is struck from behind by a second creature. Alec gets knocked to the ground. The creature landing on top of him, scratching and biting at his upper back, tearing out his flesh, though not too deep. Alec turns over, reaches into his jacket. There's an explosion, and the creature is thrown off him, a large hole in its chest. Alec drops his gun, and as he struggles to his feet, he draws out a second gun and points it at the second creature, shooting it in its head. Growling harshly, the third creature dives at Alec. Alec raises his sword, but isn't fast enough. The creature reaches him and sinks its teeth into his free arm to the bone. Alec's sword drops to the ground. The creature remains latched on Alec's arm. Alec kneels down with the creature. He grabs his sword and uses it to sever the creature's head. Alec puts his sword down, grabs the head, tearing it apart, ripping it from his arm. The head drops to the ground as Alec falls back, drained. 
Holding tight to his wounded arm, Alec stumbles over to the first creature, still twitching. Alec gets down on his knees next to it, disgust clear on his face. <coughs> Alec opens his mouth, revealing his fangs. He bites into the creature, sucking its blood. After a moment, Alec retracts himself from the creature, grabs up his sword, and stumbles away. Exterior castle. Later, people are leaving the castle, some dazed and slightly confused. They have fresh, bark, might, bark, fresh bite marks on their necks. Abe and Trisha emerge, Abe grabbing Trisha and pulling her over to the side. She's dazed and confused as well, rubbing absently at the bite marks on her neck. Abe is untouched. They are alone. You need to find him. Huh? Alec. Oh, your savior. He's not here. Yes, Trisha, I know that. Come on, snap out of it. I don't know what happened to him in there, but he ran off. You've got to find him. Why do I have to find him? I just want to go and sleep. Just trust me, please. We need him, but if he's in trouble, we need us, our help, your help. You've done it before. You can do it again. My help? What do you, what do you mean by it again? Yes, your help. You, you, you don't remember. You were too young. I still don't get it. Loud voices reach them from deep in the woods. No, no, it's not safe. Just, just go find him. Help him if he needs it. I'll explain everything later, if I can. But please do it for me. All right. No, go. Just now. He, he can't be far. He, he can't be gone far. Abe gives Trisha a push, prompting her to stumble off. Abe watches her go, then turns and heads in the other direction. Interior chapel night. The vampires are continuing to feed on a few hoot humans, the rest of the chapel being empty. The master is standing alone, distracted. Peter approaches the master sheepishly. Tonight's feeding went well, master. Yes. The way I feed, you promised if the night went well. I did, I promised, but I think you've had enough. I've got enough vampires to do for right now. I need you as a human for the time being. Yes, Master. There is something I need you to do for me. What must I do, Master? The stranger who arrived here last night. Alan. Uh, sorry, Master. I, I couldn't help but listen in. If I find out you've been in the castle again without my permission, oh, just never mind. I, I need you to find it. Keep an eye on it for me. Report back to me what he does. The master moves forward and hits Peter across the face as quick as a fall. Peter stumbles back and tumbles over, falling hard, his nose bleeding profusely, though not broken. A few vampires look up, then lazily return to feeding. Peter cries out, overreacting. My nose! Oh, God, it's bleeding! Oh, God, you ask another question, it'll be more than your nose. Peter remains quiet and on his knees. The master turns away from him. Keep an eye out. Report everything back. Nothing more. Of course, Master. Will I get something after? The Master turns, and Peter's whole body flinches. He quickly gets up and starts to scurry away. Yes, Master. I'm going, Master. You will be pleased with me, Master. Oh, just go! As Peter scurries out of the chapel, the Master leans over as if in pain before fading, a thick fog forming. A moment later, the vampires raise their heads, then fade as well, turning to fall. Exterior woods later. Some guardian creatures are roaming, hunting. Other than that, the area is silent. Peter, his nose now stuffed up, up, is watching the guardian creatures. Abe stumbles out of the foliage and almost runs into Peter. Peter is startled by Abe's sudden appearance, though he tries to hide it. What are you doing out here? Nothing. What are you doing? You shouldn't be out here so close to those things. They're beautiful creatures. Well, what's it to you anyway what I'm doing? Not much. Just head inside where it's safe. I can't. I've got orders. Orders? What are you up to, Peter? Between you and me? Of course. Well, I only tell you this because our master has promised your daughter. I'm to find the stranger and watch him. Report his actions back to our master. Then our master shall finally reward me. Make me one of them. 
then I'll have Trishna to do with as I please. Yes, our master will reward me. I will stand by our master's side, and all will bow to me. Peter zones out. Peter. Peter doesn't hear anything. Peter. What? What, 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 what did you want? Do you know where this stranger is now? Perhaps. Where? Not that it matters. It's easy to find. We used to play there as kids. It's where I used to feel safe. Do they know? No. The master's not able to track any longer. I don't know why. Our master is very angry. That's interesting. What's that? Nothing. Not important. I don't think I've spoken to you enough, old man. You go home where it's safe and keep your daughter close, because I'll be coming for her soon enough. Of course, Peter, you're, you're right. Peter turns from Abe, watching the creatures again. Abe turns slightly, bends down, and picks up a small tree branch. He hefts it a moment, then swings it hard against the back of Peter's head, knocking him out. Peter falls to the ground unconscious. Abe kneels down beside him, checking to make sure Peter's still alive. Sleep well, my dim-witted friend. Hopefully this nightmare will be over when you wake up. Abe gets up and hurries off. Exterior barn sank. The barn is old and faded, nearing collapse. Trisha emerges from the woods, carrying her bow and arrows. She runs across the field towards the barn. She stops a moment at the entrance, looks around, then enters the barn, closing the door behind her. Exterior woods say. Peter is still lying on the ground unconscious. One of the guardian creatures approaches and starts sniffing Peter. The creature purrs and licks Peter's face. Peter wakes up groggy, then smiles and starts petting the creature. Peter struggles to his feet, holding his aching head. He picks up his walking stick, gives the creature a final pat, and stumbles off. Interior barn say. Trisha wanders around the center area of the barn. She appears to be a completely alone, though she notices some scuff marks on the ground. Each of the stalls have a unique name etched into the doors, though some are faded and worn out, some illegible. I know you're here. I'm here to help. I can't if you don't let me. You might as well show yourself. No one else here will even offer to help. You know that. More likely they'd kill you on sight. Alec emerges from one of the horse stalls, though he keeps to the shadows. The name on this particular stall is almost completely legible. Darkness. Come into the light. Alec shuffles forward. He's in better shape than earlier, though still not out of the woods. Alec stands there for a moment, staring intently at Trisha. He has difficulty speaking. I remember you. Alec takes a few stumbling steps forward, struggling to stay on his feet, then falls to his knees. He stays up a moment longer, then groans and <coughs> falls to the ground out cold. Trisha stands over Alec, bewildered. Exterior barn day, 20 years earlier. The barn is new and clean. Young Alec scurries across the field, dressed for a long trip. He stops at the door to the barn, looks around, then scurries into the barn, closing it behind him. Interior barn. Young Alec wanders around the center area of the barn, searching. He appears to be alone. Trisha, you hear? The door to one of the stalls opens, and young Trisha, 15 years old, pokes her head out. The door on the stall says, darkness. There's also a jet black horse in the stall. Trisha's prepared for a long trip, just as young Alec is. I'm here. I'm alone. We don't have much time. My father's waiting for us. Are you sure this is a good idea? The boundaries are guarded day and night now. How are we to get past the guardian creatures? And if the fog begins to gather? Young Alec approaches young Trisha and takes her into his arms, holding her. I told you. My dad can get us through to safety. And if he can't, I'll protect you. I promise. You sure? 
Young Alec leans in and kisses her. Young Peter, about 15 years old, is watching them from the partially open door. Return to present. Exterior, small, clearing, night. Brian, dressed sloppily, emerges from the darkness, a torch in hand. He steps, stops, looks around, confused. There's a sudden gust of wind blowing the torch out. He mutters incoherently. A pale, slender hand grabs his shoulder, caresses his neck. Brian shivers, then turns around to face the master. The hood lowered, revealing her to be Queen Victoria. The master, in appearance, seems ageless, looks young, but is about 55 years old. She smiles, seductively revealing her fame. What are you doing so far from home, darling? Hmm? The time has come for us to talk. I remember. Well, a flash of foggy light from the master's hand sparks and moves across Brian's forehead. Exterior Woods Day, 20 years earlier. The master has her hand out, a strand of fog extending from her palm, connecting to the ball of fog around young Alec's head. Young Alec is on the ground in pain, remaining conscious the entire time. What are you doing to my son? Only what I promised I'd do, making him like me and my son. I seem to remember when he was awesome. You can't do this. It wasn't the deal. He was to leave here, be free. Oh, well, he will. He'll be free, just as I promised you. But as one of my dark children, nearly a lady. That's not freedom. He'd be your slave. It'd be hell. No. No, 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 that is not hell. But you will get a chance to experience that. Existing in body, but not in mind. Your usefulness will come to an end. Our son is mine. And you'll forever rule your empty kingdom with an equally empty mind. Brian reaches for his sword, but the master raises her free hand more quickly. A second ball of fog springs from her palm and flies toward Brian. The ball of fog hits him square in the face, knocking him to the ground, dissolving into his head, leaving Brian unconscious. The master looks at young Alec, who's watching, terrified. The sound of crunching leaves draws the master's attention. She turns her head towards the thick fog. Who's there? Show yourself. I command you. Without warning, a silver-tipped arrow comes flying out of the darkness. 